السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد As always we commence by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and may he bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness. Ameen. Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, as I walked out yesterday, my young son told me that you have made a mistake. I told him, what is the mistake? He says, you said the Sahara Desert when it was the Arabian Desert. So I looked at him and I laughed and I said, don't worry, tomorrow I will start with that slip of the tongue. When we spoke of Umayyah ibn Khalaf, and how Bilal ibn Rabah remembered everything that had happened and how he was dragged in the desert, it was the Arabian desert. And I'm sure we would all have known that it was a mere slip of the tongue. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. The battle of Badr, we had completed it. I just want to recap two or three points from this battle of Badr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent three days in Badr after the war. The reasons for that, so that the enemy does not come back. They had fled. And some of them might decide to come back whilst the Muslims were going to Medina Munawwara. So one of the reasons was, or to remain in Badr, was to ensure that that does not happen. Secondly, to bury both sides, to bury the Muslims who had lost their lives, the 14 of those who had lost their lives, and at the same time to bury the Mushriks in a mass grave or in the pit that they were finally buried in al qalib so to bury those who were dead and those who had been martyred. The third reason was in order to gather the spoils or the booty or that which was left behind by the kuffar of Quraysh as they had departed or as they had fled. And the fourth reason was that the army needed a little bit of a rest. And what would happen is if they were to immediately move, Without resting, perhaps they will get tired and so on. So it served many purposes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had instructed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to remain there for three days. Remember, whatever he did was by the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, when they got to a place known as As-Safra, there, there was an instruction that had come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to divide the spoils or the booty in a specific way. However, mention must be made of the little debate that took place between some of the parties from amongst the Muslims as to what should happen with these spoils. This was the first major battle. They had had quite a lot that was left behind by the kuffar of Quraysh. And so as they were debating what should happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses instructing them. They are asking you about the spoils of war. Tell them that those spoils of war belong to Allah and His Messenger. Whatever they decide is final. So be conscious of Allah and sort your matter out. Don't dispute amongst each other. And remember, if you are true believers, you will follow Allah and His Messenger. Those are the verses, the opening verses of Surah Al-Anfal. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided that he will give everyone an equal share. And he decided to add nine of those who did not take part in the war, who had been left in Medina Munawwara by his instruction or who had been sent elsewhere by his instruction at that particular time. Something also very important, two more points that I want to make mention of the Battle of Badr before we proceed. One is Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu had a brother of his known as Abu Aziz. And this Abu Aziz ibn Umayr, he was from amongst those who was caught and when Mus'ab saw them taking him, he passed a comment. Before I say what he said, it's important for us to know who was Mus'ab. Once again, we make mention 
He came from a wealthy family. He was spoiled to the degree that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says from the youngsters of Mecca, I don't know a single one who has been spoiled this much by his own mother. And when he accepted Islam, he was tied down by his mother and thereafter he was expelled, he was harmed, he was tortured. And until there came a time when his skin was flaking off and he was so poor, he didn't even have clothing, he lost his weight and so on. When Mus'ab saw his brother, who was mashallah looking quite well, but he was from amongst those who was caught. He tells the captives, you better make sure you ask for a handsome amount from this man because his folks are very wealthy. Allahu Akbar. His folks are very wealthy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a goodness and may he, may he grant us wealth that will be a means of our entry into paradise and not wealth that will be a means of our destruction. So that was very interesting that even though it was his own brother, but he felt towards him to say the truth and to say, look, you better get a maximum amount from this man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. And the last point we'd like to mention is, as we said yesterday, that some of the people who didn't have any wealth to pay or to pay the fine for taking part in the war, some of them didn't have the amount. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he let some of them go without even taking any amount from them. One of them was Abu Azza al-Sha'ir and we will come to see his story a little bit later on. We said it yesterday, part of it, that when he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look, I am a person who really doesn't have much. My family is big and they need me and so on. And I really don't have anything to give you. He was then sent away and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, you don't ever engage in what you did in, in the future. And he said, okay, I won't. Now, from amongst those who were taken captive were some who didn't have anything, but they were educated. They could read and write. So the Prophet sallallahu issued an instruction. He said, if any one of you can teach 10 of the youngsters of the Ansar how to read and write, we set you free. Subhanallah. This showed that the value of learning to read and write and education and the value of being able to understand and so on was so high that people were granted their freedom just by teaching people how to read and write. And I normally raise a point when it comes to the teachers. These people who were captive were not Muslim. And for them, what was their paradise? Their paradise was to be set free so that they could live the rest of their lives according to their own desires. So they were told, if you teach 10 people to read and write, you will get your paradise in the sense that you're going to be free in this world. And for you, the world is the paradise. So those who teach the Muslims how to read and write from amongst the Muslims and those from amongst the Muslims to this day, and we know that teaching is now a profession that many people are turning away from because it is one of the only professions where your progress is gauged by the examination of someone else. Have you ever thought of that? A teacher is tested by who? Not by whether they know it or not, but by whether other people know what they've taught them or not. So it's very difficult. And nowadays people don't really want to teach. Ask those running schools. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. The point I am raising is imagine how valuable the reward is that Allah is giving these mushriks of Quraysh what they wanted. Is it impossible for Allah to give us our paradise as a result? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us and may he make us from those who can teach because definitely even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Innama bu'ithu mu'allima, I was actually sent as a teacher. Obviously the teachings he taught were very spiritual and connected to the link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but he was also a teacher and he was a powerful teacher. And he did not beat any of his students. And at the same time, they learned absolutely everything that he had taught them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a portion of that barakah. Now, as we said yesterday, we ended on a point that Banu Qaynuqa, they were people who were living within Medina Munawwara. There were three clans of the Jewish people around Medina two and within Medina one of them. So Banu Qaynuqa was inside Medina and as for Banu Qurayza and Banu Nadir, they were on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. In the marketplace of Banu Qaynuqa, something had happened. But prior to that, Banu Qaynuqa were very, very upset when, when the Quraysh had suffered a defeat 
and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his companions had come back. Allah calls the day of Badr, Yawm al-Furqan. The day of the criterion, the day that the deciding factor or the day of the deciding factor. The, the Muslims had won and it was a huge victory. These people were upset. Why? They were hoping that this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his people would lose and then we would be the leaders once again because they could not engage in all their mischief when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is in their midst or in Medina Munawwara. So they had teamed up with one of the hypocrites who joined, who joined Islam only for show. How do we know that? How do we know that this man was a hypocrite? The answer is we can never know unless we were told by Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that Allah informed him a list of names of people who were actually not Muslim, but they were just pretending because they had had no other option or they felt that it was in the best of their interests. From amongst them was this man, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He had accepted Islam just after that. It is made mention of in a lot of the narrations that it was after the Battle of Badr. And this is when he saw that the Muslims have quite a bit of power and let me join forces with them. So he had teamed up with the people of Quraysh and he had teamed up with Banu Qaynuqa and he tried to tamper with Banu Nadir and the others. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposed him every single time. So in the marketplace of Banu Qaynuqa was a Muslim Sahabiyya who was seated. And she was seated, her name is not given to us. And obviously, if you look at the books of Islamic history, you find whenever something bad has happened to someone, the name is always protected in a lot of cases so that people wouldn't actually be able to say, oh, this person and that person, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. And even though it's not relevant for us to know certain things, we need to know there was one of our sisters, one of the Sahabiyat, may Allah be pleased with her, as she was sitting down, the bottom of her dress was tied to the top of it with a little stitch by one of these mischievous men of Banu Qaynuqa. And when you are sitting, you wouldn't really notice anything because the dress is all around. And as she got up, part of her leg showed. So they started laughing at her. When they laughed at her, one of the Muslims who understood what had happened went to beat up this man from Banu Qaynuqa so much so that he died. The man from Banu Qaynuqa had died. And when this happened, the people of Banu Qaynuqa got up and they started beating up this man until he also died. And thereafter, news went to al Madinah al munawwara Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam announced war straight. He told his men, let's get up. And he, with Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu, we are going to Banu Qaynuqa and we will deal with them. How dare they break the treaty? And they've been engaging in mischief all along. And now they have killed one of our men and they have disrespected or they have made a fool of one of our sisters. Subhanallah, how can they do this? And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to them. Banu Qaynuqa was shocked because they had known that this mischief of ours is going to come to the fore at some stage, the Prophet ﷺ surrounded them. And decision was being made as to what to do with these people. He surrounded them for 15 days. They wanted to fight, they couldn't fight. Because the Muslims had outnumbered them. And at the same time, they succumbed after 15 days to the pressure. Because nothing going in, nothing coming out. And these people are now surrounded for 15 days. And they decided, let's talk. So decisions were being made. The hypocrite Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And what was his power? He claims or he says, because I was supposed to be selected the leader of Medina before you came. So I am one of the top leaders. So he placed himself as one of the top leaders, although he was a nobody. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So this Ubay comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul and he gets hold of him and says, release these people. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, leave me alone. Meaning you don't need to hold someone in this particular way. There is a way of speaking. He says, no, I won't leave you until you leave these people. Because when I had before you came difficulty with other tribes, they protected us. And these were the people who did this and who did that. And they had safeguarded us with their lives. And today, just because they did one thing, you want to now execute them and so on. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, he was quite upset. 
And he said, okay, we will leave them, but they must leave Medina Munawwara. They must go. This little suburb must be clear, empty. So now that was a decision made by the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Banu Qaynuqa, a little suburb in Medina Munawwara, where these people were based, they were told, we are giving you three days. You take your children, your families, and you walk out. Everything else you leave here, you go. And the Prophet sallallahu who had gone with Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, uh, with a group of men, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had placed Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu an as a person who would oversee and supervise the fact that these people left. And within three days, they were gone. Where did they go? They all left to Adru'at. And they were actually very fortunate that the Prophet sallallahu did not execute some of those perpetrators because by right, they had murdered someone and they had engaged in mischief. So there could have been a court case there, which would be decided within moments. And a few of them would have been executed. But he did them a favor by telling them, okay, just leave. More or less exiling them, sending them away. So they had gone to a place known as Adru'at, close to Asham, which is, as we always say, the Syrian region. The reason why I say region, some people think that Asham refers to Syria. No. It refers to Syria, Lebanon, as well as Palestine and northern Saudi Arabia as well. That entire part is referred to as Asham. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. So this was what had happened for the people or to the people of Banu Qaynuqa, a lesson for us all. The respect and dignity of a Muslim, male or female, should be at our hearts. We should feel pain when one of us is harmed or hurt. And this is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Al-Mu'minuna, the believers, are like one body. The head is hurt, the rest of the body is restless. A little finger is hurt, the whole body is restless. The day we feel that way, we will resolve the matters of the ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return us to those genuine feelings. Today, amongst us in one community, we have hatred ten ways. This group and that group and this one don't talk to that one and that one his own brother he doesn't speak to and the other one when he hears that this person has had damage he is excited and says alhamdulillah instead of saying may Allah safeguard us and grant him goodness we become happy at the loss of others لا تظهر الشماتة لأخيك فيرحمه الله ويبتليك do not become happy at the loss of your brother because Allah may have mercy on him and test you with something similar if not worse may Allah سبحانه وتعالى grant us goodness. Thereafter, in the same year, it is reported or in the following year, it is reported now we are talking of the third year of Hijrah, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got his daughter Fatima Radiallahu Anha married to Ali Ibn Abi Talib Radiallahu Anhu very briefly, I can make mention of what happened. One of the servants of Ali Radiallahu Anhu had come up to him and said, did you hear that the, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fatima is now of marriage age. And at that time, they used to marry very early, 12 years old. 13, 14, 15 years old. And by that time they were all married. And sometimes even earlier than that, you have cases of people who married a little bit earlier at the ages of six and seven and eight, and they did not get together or they did not live together until they arrived at puberty. When they arrived at puberty at the age of 10 or 11 or 12 and so on, uh, they then were sent to live with their husbands. And Alhamdulillah, this was the norm of the time. And as you know, the norms change with the changing of times. So what is normal today might seem different from what was normal at that time, but it was the norm. And what is no, the norm in one area sometimes is different in another area. So we should not get excited and we should not start picking on people. It was their norm. If there was anything wrong in anything that was happening, the people there would have stopped it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and Allah has granted some form of level of acceptance to the urf or to the norm of the people that is acceptable. And this was part of it. Yesterday we made mention of the other two daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, and I had said that they were married to the sons of Abu Lahab. If you open the books of Islamic history, yes, there is a report of them having been married to the sons of Abu Lahab, and when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to spread Islam, then he instructed his sons to divorce them and to leave them because he said, I don't want you to be uh, with these who are the children of this man who is inflicting so much harm or who has reneged from the religion of his forefathers. Now, there are two narrations. One says that they were married, but they had not consummated in the sense that it was fixed. 
like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being married to Aisha radiallahu anha, but there was no consummation at all. It happened later on. So in the same way this, there was no consummation, more or less what we would term today, these people are engaged and they will get together at some stage. Before they got together already, these two were released and later on they were married to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, first Ruqayya binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And just after the battle of Badr, she passed away. Imagine the difficulty of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had to go through a lot. He lost his sons. Now he is losing his own daughter. And he lost his daughters, all of them besides one, before he passed away himself. And he lost them, subhanallah. And yet he used to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when we lose our children before us, we should always pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Allah, make this a means of my entry into paradise. If the messenger went through this difficulty, that means you have chosen me to go through the same difficulty that the messenger has gone through. And perhaps, Ya Allah, grant me a good reward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and have mercy on all of us and on those who've lost their children uh, before their own death. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So when Ali radiallahu anhu heard this, in fact, I was making mention of the other narration. The other narration says that they were married and thereafter divorced. However, we would like to uh, give perhaps strength to the narration that says it was not consummated yet and they had divorced them. With Ali radiallahu anhu, when he heard this, he wanted to speak to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but he was a bit shy. And he was told, no, if you go, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will agree. So he comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he sits in front of him, you know, and he says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he's quiet. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Is there something you want to say, O oh, Ali? He keeps quiet. Oh, it's okay. He says, Do you want to talk to me about my daughter Fatima? Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Look at this. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam already instructed what is happening. Do you want to talk to me about my daughter Fatima? He says, Yes. He says, what do you have in, in the sense that are you going to pay her the mahar? Now this in Islam, mahar is not actually a dowry. Because a dowry, what happens in some of the cases, they pay an amount to the father, to the mother, to the grandfather, to the uncles, to the aunts, and they have to pay over so many years. And who eats the money? The parents and the others. In Islam, there is nothing like that. We say we do not sell human beings. The amount at marriage is from the groom to the bride. That's it. No other amounts are compulsory in Islam. If there is anything you want to give out of your goodness to your father-in-law or to anyone else, no problem. But it is not an Islamic requirement. The mahar in Islam means an amount from the groom to the bride. It is basically a payment to say from today on, your responsibility is mine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So when people say dowry, it must not be misunderstood. In Islam, there is nothing like a dowry that we see across the globe. It is simply an amount from here to there, from the groom to the bride. As for those who brought up these girls, the parents of the girls, the hadith says, the Prophet peace be upon him says, for you is paradise. You have brought up someone to go and live in someone else's home. What you get in return is Jannah. It is paradise. And this is why the hadith says whoever has two daughters, one narration says three daughters and looks after them well, brings them up amana as a trust, gets them married to good homes that will result in their upliftment spiritually and so on. For them will be paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So he said, look, uh, I don't have anything at all. So the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what about the shield I gave you once? He says, I've got that. He says, well, we can get that sold and you will get a certain amount for it and you can pay that as a mahar. And this is how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got his daughter married to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu when he was a man whose financial standing was zero. He had nothing, absolutely nil. Today when our daughters want to marry someone, we first look at how much money does he have? You know what? They might suffer, he's too poor. How do you know after they get married, he might lose everything. Then what happens? And do you know if you look at our parents, and I'm sure a lot of those who are of a middle age here, started off very, very humbly and slowly worked up the ladder. Now when they are 50, 60 years old, they can afford everything. 
But now they, they, for themselves, their own children, they're saying, look for a rich man. But think about how you started, my beloved brother, my beloved sister. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to look at the deen. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was a cousin, a friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. And they had had days together in Makkah al Mukarramah. And he was the first from the youngsters who had accepted Islam. And here the Prophet ﷺ is giving him his daughter. And the Prophet ﷺ says, where's the shield I gave you? Which means it was actually from me, to be honest with you anyway. Now you're getting it back. It's reported that they sold it for 400 uh, darahim. And they had given that or he had given that as a mahar to to Fatima radiallahu anha may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us acceptance and may he make us from those who realize and understand from the lessons that we've derived from this then also Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu as we've heard the one wife of his Ruqayya the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away after some time it's reported that after some time the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam got him married to his other daughter Umm Kulthum and this is why Uthman was known as the Nurain. We made mention of this yesterday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us happy homes. May He grant us spouses who will be the coolness of our eyes. I mean, we have another thing that happened after the Battle of Badr and after Banu Qaynuqa and so on. There were certain people who were criminals who were sought after by the Muslims, by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of their crimes. Crimes against humanity, against the Muslims, because of what they had done. And these were criminals of the highest order. The Prophet ﷺ ordered their execution and a few of them were executed from amongst them was one leader from amongst the Jews who was known as Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf. And he was very, very venomous, very dangerous. He has caused lots of harm to the Muslims. And he was a person who was really a criminal of note. And the Prophet ﷺ instructed his execution and he was executed. And this came as a lesson for all those who intended harm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Now we move on to the next battle. The next major battle that took place was the battle of Uhud. Between Badr and Uhud, there were skirmishes. There were a few little battles, a few little run-ins between the Muslims and some of the Mushriks, some of those who had taken part on the side of, the, of Quraysh when it came to the battle of Badr and they were just being dealt with and sorted out, nothing major. But the Kuffar of Quraysh, when they got back to Mecca, they heard the news, they were upset. Quraysh had banned crying. Nobody's allowed to cry. Why? If we cry, the Muslims are going to laugh at us. So no one's allowed to cry over their dead. Although the leaders were executed in that war. So what did Quraysh do? They got together in, at Darun Najwa, that house. And subhanallah, they decided with Abu Sufyan that you know now you are one of our leaders here. You are the man who came with the caravan. That caravan was saved. So every one of us, all the profits we've made from that caravan, we are going to use that, contributing it to another war that we are going to take to the Muslims in Medina and crush them once and for all. How much money did they make from there? 50,000 dinars. Dinars are gold coins. They had made 50,000 gold coins. You know, I was just reading this today and thinking to myself, a group of camels at that time, coming from Asham, right down to Makkah. And that one container, they made 50,000 gold coins. Subhanallah. What type of business people were these? Today, mashallah, we can bring two, three containers. Do you think you would get profit of 50,000 gold coins just by that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us barakah in whatever he gives us. So this was the business mind of the people of Quraysh. They were shrewd and they knew how to make money. And now they all promised at that house, Darul Najwa. They said, Abu Sufyan, you're our leader. All this wealth, we all coming out. Everyone is going to come out. And so with this 50,000, they had bought or they had purchased lots of weaponry and sorted it out, made it very, you know, uh, sharp and so on. Their spears and arrows. And they had prepared with their armor and shields and what have you and the horses and the fodder for the horses and so on and they were ready and they started marching out to Medina to Munawwara. Once they were ready, they began to march. Now there were certain people who did not go out with them. 
Who didn't go out with these people? From amongst them was this man, Abu Azza, a sha'ir. He said, look, I can't come out because I was amongst the captives, poor man. When Muhammad sallallahu released me, he told me, don't ever do this again. And I promised him I wouldn't, so I'm not going to go back there. Now, if they catch me, I won't be able to. One narration says they put a lot of pressure on him and they dragged him with. Another narration says, no, they did not drag him with. However, Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had returned to Mecca, he also did not come out. He said, I am not coming. I... It's very fresh in my mind what happened in Badr and I'm not interested in fighting the Muslims and so on. And he wrote a letter to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, his nephew. Oh, my nephew, Quraysh is coming out with so many men. And Quraysh is coming out with 3,000 strong men. Now this is three times the size of what they came out with the first time. And they have so much weaponry. And they have with them their women. They took out their women as well because they said, if we see our women, it will encourage us to fight because we won't want them to become from amongst the captors of war. And they took out their women, their drink, their dances and so on. They were excited once again and they started marching. The Prophet ﷺ got information of this. The letter was received by Rasulullah ﷺ. In the meantime, Quraysh, went to a few of the smaller clans, Banul Mustalik and Banul Hoon and a few others and told them, do you know what? We all need to go and fight. Everyone bring your, those who are fighters from amongst you. We're going to Medina Munawwara. So they had been joined by some of these tribes. Remember this, this name, Banul Mustalik. The reason is later on, the Prophet ﷺ went to attack them because they sided with Quraysh and they came to attack the Muslims. So when we had a chance, we went back to tell them, why did you take part on the wrong side? The treaties always stated that those who sided with the enemy were considered enemy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So as they marched, they took together with them another man and his followers. Abu Amir al-Rahib. He was a man from Al Aws, and he was a person who was supposed to be one of the leaders in Medina Munawwara with Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And in fact, when they were about to appoint Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came to Medina Munawwara. This Abu Amir ran away, and as for Ubay ibn Salul, he decided to to become a Muslim by name, and yet he he was not a Muslim. So. Abu Amir al-Rahib, he joined the Quraysh and he also proceeded to al madinah al munawwara From amongst them was a man who was a slave of Jubair ibn al-Mut'im and his name was Wahshi. This man was a slave from Abyssinia and his master told him that I will free you on condition that you execute Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib because he is the one who executed my uncle. So Wahshi, he was an innocent man. He was a little slave, but he decided, look, I need my freedom. Obviously, I want to be a free man. So let me go. He also joined the ranks. And then they arrived uh, at a place close to Medina Munawwara, just before Uhud. And before they had arrived there, the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prepared his army. And he had a system of preparing the army. He got the people together, he spoke to them, he asked them, look, this is what it is, we need to say, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for us, and definitely He is the best disposer of affairs. This is a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who in turn taught the Muslims. When something happens to you, Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough for us, and He is the best disposer of affairs. So some of the people suggested, let's stay in Medina. We'll fortify the place nicely and we will attack them from within Medina Munawwara. Who had this opinion? The older people, some of the older people. And Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, that hypocrite, he said, no, let's stay inside Medina and let the enemy come and we will attack them from within here. And the youngsters, a lot of the young people from amongst them was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib as well, who was a little bit older. But he said, let us go out and we face them outside. Because if we face them whilst we are inside, if they win, what will happen to our women and everyone else? We'd rather go outside, we face them there, fight them there and sort the war out out there. And thereafter it can be decided and we will not have to have them desecrate our homes here in Medina Munawwara. 
And they kept on telling the messenger, this is our opinion. It's a more solid opinion. We are the fighters. We are going to be fighting. We know we want to go out and so on until the Prophet wasallam decided, okay, what will happen? We will fight them outside. Let's all proceed. And it is reported that on a Friday, Jumu'ah, the Prophet wasallam took these men out and the Prophet wasallam proceeded towards Badr, uh, sorry, towards Uhud. And Uhud is very, very close. Now it is considered as inside Medina. At that time, it was outside Medina Munawwara. And they took their time getting there. So at Salat Al-Jumu'ah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led the Salah and he there, thereafter gave a khutbah to his people and he told them, look, we are going. The idea here is to defend ourselves. Remember, we did not initiate this battle. It is them who are coming to us. Take a look. Badr is closer to Medina than Makkah. And Quraysh wanted to fight, although the Muslims went for the caravan. But in this instance, Quraysh came all the way to fight the Muslims. So who was the one who initiated it? It was Quraysh. They came to Medina Munawwara. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ warned his people, look, we need to be disciplined. We need to remember that Allah has granted us victory in the past through obedience. So obey Allah. And if you obey Allah, Allah will help you. And if you disobey Allah, shaitan will be with you. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from shaitan. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thereafter, he had taken 1,000 men with him. 1,000 men. So the mushriks were 3,000 heavily armed. They came with everything they had had and they were on their way to Uhud, almost there. The Muslims, 1,000 strong men, and as they progressed, the Prophet wasallam thereafter had gone into one of the rooms and worn his armor. He wore some of the armor that he used to wear. And when he came out, some of the older people told him, no, you know, we see that you are forced to leave Medina Munawwara by these young people. It's okay, let's go back in. We won't fight. We can perhaps look at a different way of dealing with these people. He gave them a statement which was very powerful. He says, you should know that no messenger of Allah puts on an armor and then takes it off without facing that enemy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. No messenger of Allah has ever put on an armor and then removed it without Allah having decided between them and the enemy, which means without them having fought. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So thereafter, they proceeded and they got to a certain place where they camped for the evening. In the meantime, the Prophet wasallam had given the flags to three people. The Muhajireen, they had the biggest flag. It was given to Mus'ab ibn Umair. It was considered the main flag, which was the flag of the army of the Muslims. And as for the Ansar, they were divided into two. The Khazraj, the flag was given to Al-Hubab ibn Al-Mundir. And Aus, the flag was given to Usaid ibn Hudayr, and these three had proceeded with the Muslim army. For your information, the flags were very important because when a flag was up, it meant the army is still hot, it's fighting, and it has all its weaponry, it has its, its strength. Once the flag drops, the army is more or less confused because it's like the headquarters, it's like we're looking for our leaders there. So the flags were given to strategic people always. Even the mushriks, they had their flags, which were given to strategic people from amongst them. In this case, I've given you the names. The main flag was held by Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu. When they got to Ra'sul Thaniyyah, that was a certain place. Ra'sul Thaniyyah is actually between Medina and Uhud. There is like a garden there. As they got to the garden, the Prophet wasallam saw a large battalion of people coming to join his army. And he asked, who are these? And he was told, this is the group of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. From amongst them are the people of the book of the tribes, the Jewish tribes who have settled here in Medina. The Prophet wasallam said, tell them to go back. We are not going to get their help to attack the mushriks here. Subhanallah. We are not going to get their help to attack the mushriks. Now, there was some reasoning behind it. Because as it is, there was disturbance. These people could have been part of the enemy without us knowing. And they could have come in the ranks and then caused a lot of destruction. So the Prophet ﷺ sent them all back and they had gone back. The group of people who were allied to Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And as for Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, 
after they had spent that night, after they had spent the night, the Prophet وسلم, in early morning decided, let us now go towards Uhud. And as he was going, the last leg of the journey, it's not a very long journey, Abdullah ibn Ubay decides with 300 men, we're going back to Medina, we're not fighting. Why? We are not fighting because we told you we don't want to fight. We told you that we would like to stay in Medina. We are older people. And you listened to the youngsters. You listened to those who don't really have much experience. And you came out. Why should we come out so we are going back? Now this was a big problem. Very big problem. Because one third of the army of the Muslims is going back. And with them is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. So he was indeed part of the enemy and he was part of the problem. So now what happened? Some of the tribes almost joined him. Some of the tribes of the Ansar almost joined him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them strength. So with him were 300 people who were all close to him and connected to him in one way or the other. And they had gone back to Al Madinah Munawar or they decided to go back and Allah protected the rest. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed verses later on to tell us and to instruct us what had happened. To tell us what has happened. There, one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the father of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he went to Abdullah ibn Ubay and he tried to tell him, look, come back. How can you decide to do this? We are all out here. We accepted the messenger. We told him we would protect him. We said that we would protect Medina and so on. And now you want to go away. And the Muslims were divided into two groups. Some of them said, no, let us stop everything and fight Abdullah ibn Ubay. We are 700 odd. They are 300 odd. We fight them here and now. And the other group said, no, leave them for now. We have a bigger enemy to go and to deal with. So you see, there is already a crack. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And at this point, Allah reveals verses. What is it with you? How can you dispute about the hypocrites when Allah sent them back because of their deeds? They had evil deeds. Allah did not want them to take part in the battle. So Allah is the one who sent them back. Allahu Akbar. And Allah says, when Allah misguides someone, nobody can guide him. They want you to disbelieve just like they disbelieve. So don't even turn towards them. And at that stage, they were left. They were told to go back. That saved a huge difficulty because the Muslims were deciding to fight them. And Allah said, leave them alone. Let them go back. They are the hypocrites and so on. And these verses were extremely powerful and decisive at the same time. The Prophet wasallam, as he had come out and we made mention of 300 people going back, with Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, it was Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Haram who had spoken to him. And thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses that I had just read out to you. And after that, the army proceeded to Uhud. When they arrived in Uhud, they scouted the place and they saw it. And they decided we are going to stand in a way that we will be facing Medina and the mountain will be behind us. So they were facing Medina Munawwara. And they stood in a way that the mountain was behind them. When the kuffar had come around, they were on the other side of the valley. They came and they stood on the other side. So their backs were facing Medina Munawwara and the front was facing the mountain. And the Prophet wasallam, as always, he gave a lecture, powerful lecture to his people, short but to the point. He says, look, your sustenance is written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will not die until everything written next to your name gets to you. So don't think that by making haste to get something, you are actually going to increase your sustenance. No, what Allah has written for you will come to you. So be careful, to, uh, be careful and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, obey instructions for it is the obedience that granted us victory in Badr. How did we get victory in Badr? Obedience. They obeyed Allah and his instruction. When Allah told them go to Badr, they all went. When Allah said you will now fight these people, they all fought. 
So now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned them. He gave them a powerful lecture and thereafter he had placed the rose as he always places with those who were the who had the arrows and bows in the front and the horsemen behind and thereafter you have a new group of people because there was a mountain behind them there was a mountain behind them the mount uhud mount uhud is a huge mountain and it has a few hillocks around it so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he studied uhud he placed between 40 and 50 archers some most of the narration say 50 some of them say between 40 and 50 he placed these archers on the hillock and the head of these archers was a man known as Abdullah ibn Jubayr al-Ansari, powerful man. The Prophet ﷺ told him in front of all the archers, look, we are placing you on this hillock. You are here to protect our backs. If you see we are winning, don't leave this mount. If you see we are losing, don't leave this mount. No matter what happens, do not leave this mount. That's the instruction. Because this is a strategic place from which the enemy can attack. They understood it very carefully, mashallah, and they were also very active with their spears and arrows from the top there, alhamdulillah. And as we mentioned yesterday or previously when we spoke of the Battle of Badr, they started with the duels. This time it was slightly different in the sense that previously three came out from the mushriks, three came out from the Muslims. This time one of the men came out from the mushriks and immediately as he came out, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam came out to him, executed him. They were shocked. Within a minute, the war had started. But the two armies, one was on the side closer to Medina and the other one was on the side closer to Mecca. And one man is already gone. This is the duel that they had had. So immediately after that, Talha ibn Abi Talha came out. And as he came out, he was a mushrik from the Meccan army. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu came out and executed him. Within a minute, he was also gone. Now his son decides, let me come out. In fact, his brother, Uthman ibn Abi Talha, he was also a mushrik. As he came out, Hamza radiallahu anhu came out and executed him. And the mushriks are watching. And they are shocked because one after the other, they started losing, losing their men. And thereafter, Abu Sa'ad ibn Abi Talha, another brother came out. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas hit him with an arrow or with a spear and he also dropped, executed, gone. Thereafter, four of the members of the same family, one after the other, came out. Each one of them was wiped as they came. And then the mushriks became so upset and it, it resulted in them becoming so angry. They started charging forward with their horses. And as they charged forward, they got to a place where the arrows were released by the Muslims as they were released in Badr and the horses were struck and that caused great chaos and the horses began to go back. Some of them had dropped. People started losing their lives and it was only the beginning of this battle. So quick, everything started happening very, very quickly. And thereafter, there was a hot struggle. When I say hot, I mean the heat of the moment. What had happened is Wahshi says later on, he became a Muslim sometime later. He was the slave of Jubair ibn al-Mut'im. He says, I was watching Hamza because I had seen him from the duel and I knew who he was. And as I'm watching him, I moved to the side, I moved to this side. I had no other job. I did not harm anyone, no one, nothing else did I do besides holding one spear and waiting for one man. And he says, when I found him alone at a certain place, I hit him and it hit his belly, according to one narration, uh, just below his navel. And he says, I dropped him. He was down cold and I was done. Allahu Akbar. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, who was known as Asadullah, the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was also known as Sayyidul Shuhada. He was also known as the leader of the martyrs. Subhanallah. He was martyred in the battle of Uhud and the one who killed him, his name was Wahshi. He did it because he wanted to earn his freedom. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu was martyred. And the war became such that the mushriks started losing one after the other. They were losing a lot. And as they were losing, they decided to turn back and to flee. 
And so they started running away. The people of Makkah, as many as they were, they started running away, leaving behind a lot of their belongings. When they started running away, some of the Muslims began to gather some of the belongings of the mushriks, thinking that let's get it and put it on one side so that we, we know where it is and so on. And thereafter, Allahu Akbar, something very dangerous happened, which changed the course of the whole war. Abdullah ibn Jubayr al-Ansari, who was the head of the archers on that mount, found that some of his men insisted, now the war is over, let's go down and start collecting and gathering. He said, no, the instruction of the messenger was this, remain here. They said, no, 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 the war is over, let's go. So what had happened? A lot of them went and they left the hillock. When they left the hillock, Abdullah, Allahu Akbar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them goodness. These people who had remained behind Abdullah ibn Jubayr al-Ansari and a few of the people, they found Khalid ibn walid who was from amongst the mushriks at the time. He had a little battalion with him. When he saw that these people are no longer on the hillock, he decided to come around and he came onto that mountain. They executed all of the remainder of the archers who were very few, including Abdullah ibn Jabir al-Ansari. And what had happened is he came and sandwiched the Muslims between the enemy who now turned around when they had heard a new noise and they then came and they began to attack the Muslims. And this is when the Muslims suffered great losses on that day, although there was no decisive victor because the Muslims continued fighting. People began to lose their lives. And from amongst them, Musa ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, who was holding the flag, they chopped off one, one of his hands. So he held it with the other hand. They sliced his other hand. So he pulled, put it close to his chest until they executed him. And the flag dropped. And news spread that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been killed. And when that happened, there was a lot of chaos in the Muslim army. And thereafter, the kuffar began to kill a lot of people. And the sahaba radiallahu anhum were surrounding Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taking the arrows and spears for him. And a lot of them lost their life in that way. And thereafter you find the arrows hit Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his face and he had marks on his cheeks and he had a gash on his head and at the same time a rock was thrown on him. And what happened is the name of the man who threw the rock, Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas. He threw this rock on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which broke his tooth. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bleeding and thereafter you find a man known as Ubay ibn Khalaf. He was an enemy of Islam from the beginning, the days of Makkah. He told the messenger, I will kill you. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Inshallah, it will be the other way around. So he was now coming for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum are protecting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Leave him, let him come. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a spear and threw it, which hit him to the degree that later on when he was running away, he died. It is reported that this was the only person ever who died as a result of being struck by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one else in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was ever struck, which resulted in their death by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding and may he grant us goodness. It is important for me to make mention that the Muslims retreated. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a was the man who killed this Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas who had thrown a rock on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When the Muslims retreated to part of the mount as the mount subhanallah was behind them, they retreated to part of the mount and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was being treated by some of his companions, his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha. Some of the females of the Sahabiyat had come from a distance. They were assisting with the water and they were assisting in trying to uh, uh, help the wounded and so on. They were there and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses that were so powerful. Seventy of the Muslims had been martyred approximately. One figure takes it a little, a little bit higher than 70. And from amongst the disbelievers, between 20 and 40 of them were martyred. And subhanallah, the verses revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
وما أصابكم يوم التقى الجمعان فبإذن الله وليعلم المؤمنين What happened to you the day the two armies met in Uhud was by the will of Allah in order to know who are the true believers. وَلِيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ نَافَقُوا And in order to know the hypocrites. وَقِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْ قَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَوْ اِدْفَعُوا قَالُوا لَوْ نَعْلَمُ كِتَالًا لَاتَّبَعْنَاكُمْ And the hypocrites were told Come and fight in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they, Allah says, they responded, had we known how to fight, we would have been right behind you. And this was the exposure of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salun. He went back with so many men. Allah says, هُمْ لِلْكُفْرِ يَوْمَ إِذٍ أَقْرَبُ مِنْهُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ on that day, they were closer to disbelief, these hypocrites, than they ever were to Iman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent verses saying, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ Allah has indeed fulfilled His promise to you when you were executing these people one after the other. You see how it started? It started in a way where the flag bearers of the mushriks were lost or their lives were lost one after the other and there was chaos in the ranks of the disbelievers. Then Allah says, Hatta idha fashiltum wa tanaza'tum fil amri wa asaytum min ba'di ma araakum ma tuhibboon Until a point when you disobeyed and you had become discouraged because of your disobedience to Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after you saw that which you loved. What was it that they loved? Oh, the booty of the war. They saw so much of it and they started rushing. So Allah is admonishing the archers to say the reason why you had suffered loss is because of your disobedience of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ From amongst you there are some who wanted this worldly life and some who were prepared for the life after death. Allah says, ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَفَى عَنْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ then by Allah's mercy, did Allah cause them to go away. So the mushriks of Mecca went away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah then forgave the believers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from his mercy. Abu Sufyan, as he was leaving, he looks at the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he uttered a statement. He says, a day for a day, which means you attack, attacked us on Badr, today we have attacked you here. And as they were leaving, they said, you will find from your dead those who have been cut up and ripped up after they were executed. I did not instruct this. They did it themselves. So don't hold it against us. But we will return next year. We will meet and we will fight again. Same time at a place known as Badr. These were the last words of Abu Sufyan as he left. And inshallah tomorrow we will see what was the aftermath of this battle of Uhud where the Muslims did not win but the Kuffar did not win either. Had they won, they would have gone into Medina Munawwara but they did not enter Medina Munawwara. They left from there because they found even those who had remained of the Muslims were fighting like brave warriors. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Perhaps tomorrow we will see a little bit more of what happened and thereafter draw some lessons for us all until we meet again. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.